Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the second session of the People's Law School. For those of you who were absent last week, I am Larry Springberg, your moderator for the series. Please remember that we are on a tight schedule, and as we saw last week, the presenters are challenged to cover all of their great material in the time that they have been allotted. If you have questions, write them neatly on the index cards, hold them up for us to collect, and we will try to get to as many of them as possible. We will take a short break after the first two presentations, but we'll keep it brief at just five minutes. And please turn off any cell phones or put them to quiet mode. Now I, I would like to introduce Judge Timothy Williams. Judge Williams was appointed to Department 16 of the 8th Judicial District Court in 2006. He manages a complex civil litigation caseload of about 1,000 cases, with over one-third of the construction defect cases in Clark County. He has 20 years of complex civil litigation e experience and has served in the role as an arbitrator and mediator in hundreds of cases on behalf of the citizens of Clark County. In addition to his commitment to the law, Judge Williams has been honored as Humanitarian of the Year for his role in assisting boys from single parent homes. Judge Williams has also sponsored Little League Baseball and junior high basketball teams in Clark County. Please join me now in welcoming Judge Williams to the People Law School for his presentation on the judicial system. All right, Larry, I just want to thank you for that gracious uh, introduction. And I'd like to say uh, good evening to everyone here. And uh, it's truly a pleasure and honor to be here. And, and one of the, uh, my topic is very dear to me. I'm going to talk to you about the uh, jury trial. Very, very important uh, cornerstone of our great democracy. And I want to spend a little time on that concept with you. And, um, you know, when you, when you look at it from a historical perspective, one of the hallmarks of liberty and freedom in this great nation is the jury trial. And uh, under our system of civil justice, uh, whether it's a criminal case or a civil case, you do have a right uh, to a jury trial. And one of the things I really kind of want to go into, uh, as far as the jury system is concerned, is, is to really talk about the origin of the jury system, not only in this country, but also from a historical perspective before this nation was founded. Because there's a couple of things I want to talk to you about that I always talk and discuss with every jury that uh, comes into my department. You know, when you look at, the, at this great country, um, you know, jury decisions have played an important role in the history of this country. And um, this is so, so important to me. And uh, understand, we've had uh, jury trials in my department that have lasted a couple of days. We've also had jury trials that have lasted any time, anywhere from three, four, five months. I finished a jury trial up this past summer that was 39 days of actual trial testimony. And so when you put that in perspective, we started trial in uh, June, we finished up in September. So, you know, they can be very complex. They can be um, um, very time consuming. But it's important for you to understand this because down at the Regional Justice Center where all the jury trials are held, we do understand one thing. Uh, when you get your summons in the mail for jury duty, I don't think most citizens of this country sit back and reflect and say, you know what? I just got the summons in the mail, and I just can't wait to go down and participate and perform my jury service. Has anyone here received a jury summons? Most of you. And you didn't have those thoughts, did you? No, no I know you didn't. That's OK, though. Because you know, I, I, I want you to think about why one of the reasons this country was founded and uh, one of the things I always do, the day we start a jury trial in my department, I like to remind the citizens of Clark County of one important document, and that's the United States Constitution. 
And just as important too, you know, the United States Constitution has a preamble. When is the last time you've read the preamble to the United States Constitution? High school, school right? It's been a long time. But we're going to read it today together again. Very, very important document. So when you look at the document, think about it for, from this perspective, and that's the preamble to the United States Constitution. And put it in this perspective. That's the preamble, that's the mission statement for the founding document of this great nation. And there are certain rights that are listed or enumerated in, in the preamble to the United States Constitution. But let's see what the first right that the founders of this country stated in the document. We the people of the United States, in order to form a perfect union, establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, and to provide for common defense, promote the general welfare, and secure the blessings of liberty, to ensure ourselves and our posterity, do ordain and establish this United States of America. Interestingly though, the first right enumerated is what? It's justice. Because that's really one of the reasons why we declared independence from, from England. And we'll talk a little bit about that. Justice is a, was a big deal for the founders of this country. And so when you get that summons in the mail, I want you to think about why you got the summons in the mail. I, we realize it's a great inconvenience, it is. You're working, you have family, you have all these things you have to take care of in your daily lives. But you can serve this great nation in many ways. We have, we have those that go into public service, law enforcement, firefighters, and the like. We have those that serve in the military. But if you're a, an average citizen for, that for whatever reason did not you know, take that path, you know what? There's a way you can serve also. And it's an important service. And that's to serve on a, ju on a, on a, on a jury. That's your duty. And that, that really and truly guarantees that our system of democracy will work. You know, we, we're gonna talk a little bit about the historical origin of the right to a jury trial. You know, interestingly enough, you know, we, we declared uh, our independence from England, but the concept of a jury trial, uh, a lot of the concepts do come from England, based upon English law. And if you go back, you know, the jury system was established almost a thousand years ago. It's a long time ago when you think about it, really and truly. But it's amazing that system is, is, is in place in this country. And uh, many countries across the world don't have a jury system. You know, the jury system was well established as an aspect of English law going all the way back to the Magna Carta in 1215. That's a long time ago. And even back in 1066, the Normans in their conquest of England had a form of a jury trial to resolve disputes. And I guess from a historical perspective, the first case was in 1225 of a, in Rex versus French where there was demand for a jury trial. Now, one of the things you have to remember, you know, before this, before the Declaration of Independence and the founding of this country, uh, the citizens of this, of, uh, I shouldn't call citizens because it was before citizenship, it was before we formed, but the um, members of the colonies, you know, um, of course they were under English rule. And you've heard about taxation without representation. That was one problem. We know all about the Boston Tea Party. But a really significant problem was the fact that under um, that current system of justice for a, a, a colonial member, there probably wasn't really much justice at all. Now, James I ordered that English law be introduced 
and implemented with all the colonies. So they, they couldn't make their own rule of law. They had to follow the rule of law of England. And it's kind of interesting because the really, I guess, most famous and seminal case regarding that was the trial of John Peter Zinger in 1733. And you have to understand, these, this is what the colonialists were thinking about when they were forming this great nation. This is part of our history. This is how we get here. And um, essentially, under British rule, unlike today, you can watch a lot of television, and everybody criticizes any leader, politician. You can say whatever you want to say, right? You know, you can say what you want to say, but it wasn't necessarily like that in, um, in England because the Zinger trial, because in the colonies, Back in the early 1700s, you couldn't criticize publicly one of, the, one of the governors or whoever was put in a position of authority by King James or King George. Couldn't do it. Wasn't permitted. And we see what John Peter Zinger did was this, I guess. He was a, a newspaper publicist. He had a newspaper. And he criticized the crown. He criticized the crown representative. And that was against the law. And uh, because under English law, criticism of the royal governor was illegal. Couldn't do it. You know, think about it for a second. And this is, this is how we developed all our rights. And uh, he decided he wanted his case tried. And he had a one of the founders of this country represent him, uh, Hamilton, and uh, the defense was essentially this, as far as that's concerned. Hamilton instructed the jury, they said, look, um, truth is a defense. <laughs> if the leader's corrupt, that should be a defense, and what the, what the colonialists did was this, they rejected English law and ruled in, in favor of Mr. Zinger. And, um, Today, I mean, when you think about it, that's one of the foundations, and we fail to realize it sometimes. It goes back to the 1700s, and you've, everyone's heard this as far as libel is concerned, slander is concerned, truth is an absolute defense. And that stems from Peter Zinger back in the 1700s. And see, there's a basis for all of our laws. And in fact, if you take a look at the Nevada Constitution, and that's Article 1, Section 9. Our Constitution states that when this great state was formed, it shall appear to the jury that matters charged as libelous is true and was published with good motives and for justifiable ends, the party shall be acquitted or exonerated. Truth is a defense under our Constitution. Now, another kind of important issue. Members of the colony, and this is kind of what happened, they didn't have an opportunity to select who their judges were. See, in, this, in, in, in Nevada, Nevada's a little different than some states. Uh, many of our judges are appointed by the, by the governor, and you also have elections, and they have to go, you know, stand for election. It wasn't like that in the days of the members of the colonies. The uh, judges were uh, selected by King George. <laughs> That's just how it was. And, and so essentially what happened, and I guess uh, the founders of this country, the citizens, and not citizens, but the colonialists, they rejected the judges that were appointed by um, the crown and um, refused to even participate under the system as jurors. And I guess Peter, Peter Oliver was one of the uh, last um, members of the crown that uh, uh, went ahead and, um, and participated on behalf of England. 
Now this, and see, this is all really, and these things are going on before the colonies even declared their independence. You know, this is the foundation of many of our rules of law in this country. Now let's take a quick look. Uh, we know um, July 4, 1776, that's when the Declaration of Independence was um, um, signed. But I think we sometimes forget this too. One of the grievances listed against George III was his depriving us of the benefits of trial by jury. I mean, this is one of the reasons why the Revolutionary War in, in this, that created this great country was fought. Because they, you know, the founders said, look, we want to have a jury trial. We want we the people to decide our fate, not a tribunal handpicked and selected by the crown, by the King of England. And you should think about these things next time you get your jury summons in the mail. Really and truly. It's a very, very, very important function of this great, great democracy. I don't know of any system any better. And yeah, it's not perfect. I, I will agree with that. But anything man does is not perfect, right? Really and truly. But it's, it's not bad. And interestingly, uh, one of the main gripes they had, and a really good example, and this is 40 years after the Zinger trial. Something just to kind of think about, you know? Um, that's why we did what we did. And then that was the founding of our Constitution. This was all going on in the background. These were the grievances the founders had. You know, these are what, what they had to deal with. The Constitution was ratified in 1789. Uh, 1791, Congress ratified the Bill of Rights, which codified, uh, which was codified as the first 10 amendments to the Constitution. And then the Sixth Amendment was a very, very, very important um, amendment. Because what that did was essentially this, it guarantees the right to a jury trial in a criminal prosecution case. Very, very, very important right in our Constitution. But you can see, when you, when you look at it from a historical perspective, you can see why the founders wanted to make sure that right was, was stated in the first 10, 10 amendments to the Constitution. They understood that. You know, you have, you have a right to confront your witness and all the rights that stem with that. Just as important is the seventh amendment to the Constitution. And this is when we talk about civil cases, you know, cases involving disputes, cases involving civil wrongs. The Seventh Amendment to the U.S. Constitution guarantees you right to a jury trial. You know, and uh, we have a very similar uh, guarantee in the Nevada Constitution. And essentially what we're talking about there are your rights, really and truly. And from a civil standpoint, you can think about it from this perspective. Um, before the right to jury trial, how were disputes settled? I, I can think of one way. Dueling. Do you remember dueling? <laughs> I mean, we're a civilized society, right? I don't know. I mean, um, you know, two people have a dispute. They go out and they say, we're going to settle our dispute when you take... 20 paces, I take 20 paces, we pull out our 357 magnums and we blast each other, you know. But that's probably not how we should do it in a civilized society. We all agree with that, right? And then you look at it from this perspective too. I mean, if you go back historically, uh, you go back to Europe. And um, has anyone ever heard of trial by ordeal? Right. Right. I mean, that was another way, I mean, that was a way, I guess, of determining whether or not a person was telling the truth or not, you know? And it was assumed that uh, if you were telling the truth, you could stick your hand in a vat of boiling oil, <laughs> pull the rock out and pull it back, and I guess if there was no burn um, and there was no scream, you were telling the truth. I don't know how many people <laughs> were, were, were considered telling the truth under, under, under that format, but that's... Um, that's how it was, you know? And uh, how much time? 
Okay, all right. But um, that's what we were dealing with. Now, there's a couple other things I just want to kind of get into because I think we have, we're getting a little short on time, is the issue of jury reform, you know? Because after the establishment of the Sixth and Seventh Amendment, we did have a series of reforms because, you know, in the early 19th century, and there was a, there was a time when only um, uh, white males could participate on, on, on juries. Then there was another period of time, too, and then we had the 15th Amendment and uh, guaranteed the right to vote would not be abridged on account of race, color, or a previous condition of servitude. That was in 1870. Uh, moving on, we had the Federal Civil Rights Act of 1875, uh, provided that no citizen could be disqualified from jury service. And also, you know, interestingly, there was a movement at one point uh, you had to pay taxes, you had to be a uh, property owner, and those, all those types of things, and that was part of the form. And there was a, and I guess in the 1920s, the 19th Amendment was ratified, guaranteed the right of equal suffrage to all citizens regardless of gender. So we wanted to make sure everyone had a right and opportunity to participate in the jury system. Questions at this point. All right. Um, would it be possible to have a volunteer jury system? Do you think? Well, uh, I, I don't. I don't like to say anything's possible. Yes, it is. And you could have that, and it really and truly depends on the parties. You couldn't have that in a criminal case because of the constitutional mandates and guarantees under the Sixth Amendment. But um, today, there's many forms of parties getting together and deciding privately how their disputes will be resolved. And that's what we call alternative method of dispute resolution. Uh, you can have arbitration. I think, I think a lot of us are familiar with arbitration. Uh, and you've heard the term, but that's where the parties agree that under these conditions, there'll be an arbitrator, or you can have private juries that will decide a dispute. It's not well-timed. I thought they were collecting Should I wait until later? Yeah. I don't know which. Do you, in general, do you find uh, televising of trials to be beneficial or not helpful? Well, I guess it depends on, upon what conditions the trial would be televised. Because one of the things you have to really be concerned about would be this. You want to make sure that the, uh, having a trial televised over live television doesn't intrude or deprive any of the litigants of their constitutional guarantees under the Constitution. Uh, just as important, too, it would have to be done in a way where it's not obtrusive to the process. So if that's conditions met, then potentially uh, you also want to have transparency, you know, because everyone can't come down and watch a trial. But I, I, I feel it's probably long-term beneficial in this respect in that it's important for the public to understand how the, how the system works. And, uh, so, and you just can't come down all the time and, and watch. And uh, last question, what are your thoughts on keeping jurors anonymous in a high-profile case? Well, I don't think there's, I, I don't really have any thoughts. I can just tell you um, what our Supreme Court do, has done. Uh, we had a, a case uh, involving, I think it was uh, uh, jury questionnaires. And uh, it was a question as to whether or not those should be made public. And uh, our Supreme Court said uh, the identities of the jurors uh, should be uh, disclosed, you know, really and truly. Uh, I, can I can see where that might be a problem in a high-profile criminal case. That might be an issue where our Supreme Court has to look at again. But I don't, I don't really decide the policy on that. I, I think the bottom line is, as long as the jury, the members of the panel are adequately sequestered and protected during the course and scope of the proceedings, that's the most important thing. Great. Please join me in thanking Judge Williams for a very informative presentation on the importance of the jury system. Thanks, Tim.
I'd like to now introduce our speakers on personal injury actions. Jim Crockett was born in Houston, Texas and has lived in Nevada since 1952. He graduated from Loyola University and from the University of the Pacific McGeorge School of Law in 1974 and has been in practice in Nevada for the last 33 years. In 1975, he was admitted to practice in federal court and in 1990 to the United States Supreme Court. Mr. Crockett is a fellow of the National College of Advocacy and has been a certified civil trial advocate by the National Board of Trial Advocacy since 1983. And in, nine, in, and in 2006, he was the Nevada Justice Association's Trial Lawyer of the Year. In addition, uh, Cliff Marchek will be speaking this evening. Mr. Marchek was born in San Francisco but grew up in Las Vegas and graduated with his bachelor's degree from the University of Nevada, Las Vegas. He also attended the University of Pacific McGeorge College of Law and graduated in 1989. Mr. Marchek was admitted to the California Bar in 1990, practiced in California for four years, but returned to Nevada in 1994. Mr. Marchek has tried more than 20 jury trials to verdict and has argued appeals before the Nevada Supreme Court and the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals. He is currently the treasurer of the Nevada Justice Association and has been a member of the Las Vegas Rotary Club since 1997. Please join me in welcoming Mr. Crockett and Mr. Marchak. Thank you and good evening. My name is Cliff Marchak. Um, Mr. Crockett's over here. He's going to come up in a little bit, so you will have an opportunity to hear his presentation too, but I'm going to sort of start things off. And <clears throat> thank you very much, Sarah. Um, I'm very excited to be here tonight to talk to you about justice in America, and I'll stay out of that light. Um, once is good enough. Um, to talk to you about this right to jury trial. Now, Judge Williams brilliantly described some of the historical origins of the right to trial by jury, and I'm going to get a little into that also, but I'm going to spend most of my time on attacks, encroachments, infringements, whatever you want to call it, on this constitutional right, because there are several attacks from different fronts that want to diminish this most important or one of the more important constitutional rights we have. Let me get into a little bit. Judge Williams mentioned the Magna Carta, and it's true. That does have the historical origins. There's a, a phrase in there. I've quoted this language, which of course you can't see, but it talks about that uh, before a person, usually back then it was a landed interest, did white male, before he or she could be deprived of liberty or property, he had to go before a right, before a jury of his peers. You've heard that expression, jury of peers. I believe it's probably that the origin of the Magna Carta is where that comes from. And uh, that was the first announcement from the landed gentry, if you will, to try to check the king's power. That right to jury trial existed in England. I think Judge Williams said the first trial was in 1225 and it existed the, through the centuries and still may exist today in some fashion. I've given you a quote here. It's kind of strange looking man, but he was a, uh, a lawyer philosopher. And I dug this quote up when I researched this presentation here. I think it really captures the real importance of the right to trial by jury. Blackstone would have been the equivalent of our Oliver Wendell Holmes, uh, of any philosopher at the, at the time. He was a judge, he was a lawyer, and he came up and he, and he said it this in Blackstone's commentaries, which was the seminal work on the law in 1765. And I want to read it to make sure you all have, can hear it if you can't see it. Here, therefore, a competent number of sensible and upright jurymen chosen by lot from among the middle rank will be found the best investigators of truth and the surest guardians of the public justice. 
for the most powerful individuals in the state will be cautious of committing any flagrant invasion of another's right when he knows that the fact of his oppression must be examined and decided by 12 indifferent men. Judge Williams gave you the origins. You know, it's in the Declaration of Independence. I want to put a little bit more explanation on the Declaration. If you remember the Declaration of Independence, in there it has that famous quote by Thomas Jefferson who penned the Declaration of Independence, saying that we are endowed by our Creator with certain inalienable rights, and those inalienable rights include life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness. That was in the introduction. But the, if you read the Declaration, it's really a list of almost innumerable grievances against the king. And one of those grievances was, and I hope you can read it, right here, and Judge Williams did point this out, it says, by depriving us in many cases the benefits of right to trial by jury. This is right in the Declaration of Independence. This was important enough to the colonists, to Jefferson, to put this in there along with quartering soldiers with the freedom of press, freedom to assemble, freedom of religion, will not be deprived of, uh, cannot be arrested or, or without due process of law. There will be no unreasonable searches and seizures. Your right to confront the witnesses before you, cross-examine witnesses. All these important rights that are in the Bill of Rights, Tenth Amendments, started here. I've given you a few quotes, again, to express the importance. This is Jefferson himself in a paper written to Thomas Paine. Uh, I think Thomas Paine was the author of Common Sense, one of the seminal publications leading to the separation from the king. I consider the trial by jury is the only anchor ever yet imagined by man by which a government can be held to the principles of its constitution. George Washington. There was not a member of the convention, I believe, who had the least objection to what is contended for by the advocates of the Bill of Rights and trial by jury. James Madison, trial by jury cannot be considered a natural right, but a resi right resulting from the social combat, uh, compact which regulates the action of the community, but is as essential to secure liberty of the people as any one of the pre-existent rights of nature. And I can give you quotes from Hamilton. I can give you quotes from Franklin. These are just three I picked. Judge Williams pointed out the Constitution. This is the Sixth Amendment right to trial by jury in the criminal cases. But I want to give you the actual language of the right to trial by jury in, in uh, civil cases. And it talks about common law and suits at common law where the value in controversy shall exceed $20, right of trial by jury shall be preserved so forth and so on. And that's what we're talking about here when Mr. Croc and I are talking about personal injury cases or civil cases. We're talking about cases that aren't criminal, but when one person has wronged another and there are multiple types of claims individuals can bring in the civil court system. And all of these claims derive from the English common law. I would say the three biggest types of claims that are down in every courthouse in this land in state court are contract claims, tort claims, and property claims. I contract, take me back 200 years, I contract with someone to buy 100 horses, I pay the money for 100 horses, he delivers me 90 horses, I have a right to hold him accountable in court under that contract for not delivering what the contract said 100 horses. I'm buying goods and services today. I'm a florist and someone's supposed to deliver a certain amount of flowers to me. I pay a certain price for those flowers and they don't deliver them or they deliver dead flowers to me. I have a right under contract law to sue that distributor for not upholding his end of the bargain, his contract. Contract law comes from common law. Tort claims. Someone runs a red light, plows into somebody else, that person who's injured has a right to bring a claim against that other person if he or she acted negligently or carelessly. A young boy out in the, his front yard plays baseball and hits a ball and breaks his neighbor's window. That neighbor has a right. There's no contract there. 
That neighbor has a right to bring a claim against that boy, maybe his parents, for breaking that window. The Ford Pinto case. Ford manufactured a vehicle which it knew would explode upon impact, rear impact, due to the placement of the gas tank. That's called a product defect case. And sure enough, when that terrible eventuality occurred and people hit people from the back, you might say, well, why is Ford responsible? That person that drove the car into the back of that car should be responsible. And he most certainly would. But it also gives a claim against the product manufacturer for making a dangerous or defective product. And our tort law has made our products safer. That's the tort system. The third type of claim would be a property claim. Boundary dispute, or I buy a piece of property and someone doesn't deliver the full amount of square footage that that property has, I have a right to sue in civil court for breach of contract for over this piece of real estate. So these are the civil court systems, and these are no less important than criminal cases. And the founders so decided that when they placed the right to trial by jury at common law in the Constitution. Our Nevada Constitution, this is a direct quote. I would suggest they've even stated it more strongly. If it could be any more strongly than it was stated in the uh, federal Constitution, they say it will remain inviolate forever. Powerful words. Here's President Reagan. President Reagan on Proclamation Day talked about the Constitution and the importance of trial by jury. So we know how important this right is. Now, if it's so important, why are we up here telling you about it? Well, I'm, we're up here telling you about it because not everybody believes that. Not every institution in this country believes in this constitutional right. And they want to take this away from you, maybe ever so incrementally, but they want to take this important right guaranteed you by the framers of this most important document called our Constitution. There are five, I've put five challenges to this right. I've listed the McDonald's coffee case as one, and as a, I'd like to have a show of hands of who knows something about the McDonald's, or has heard about the McDonald's coffee case. And if you'd leave your hands, I'll ask you next, who has a negative impression of that case? Well, not all of you do, so maybe some of you have the facts. What I, what I have here next is a clip. And we have this movie for you, and we will give this out at the end if you want this movie. This, or not movie, this is a documentary by an attorney by the name of Susan Saladoff. It was an award-winning documentary at the Sundance Film Festival. And it documented, amongst other things, the McDonald's hot coffee case. Now, the movie itself goes into many other aspects or avenues of the tort system. But the documentary covers, you're going to see in here, actual statements from family members of the woman who was burned. She is deceased, but you're going to hear statements and, and interviews of these people. This is going to run for about 15 minutes. And can I have you down here, Sarah? Can you just go to the next slide? OK. And then. My mother at 79 is very active. She drove, she drove well. She very seldom dropped anything. She very seldom spilled anything. And so at that, for uh, her age, at 79 years old, I thought she was, she was remarkable. And she had been working full time just about uh, until about a week before this all happened. My name is Charles Allen. I'd like to introduce my wife Judy and her mother Stella Liebeck. The woman who was burned by a cup of scalding hot McDonald's coffee three years ago. She cannot speak to a confidentiality agreement that she signed. 
but Judy and I have no such agreement. I am just astounded at how many people are aware of this case and how many people have a distorted view of the case. It doesn't matter where I am or who I speak to. They, oh yeah, I know all about that. And well, what do you know? I got this picture in my mind that she actually pulled up, maybe took the coffee, and dumped it. I think she went through the drive-through. She was dragging the car. We tried to drive and drink it at the same time. And it kind of popped open and it still went around. She spilled in her lap. It was too high. And then she was down. And I'll say. What would you say if I told you she wasn't driving? Oh no, she was driving. What would you say if I told you that's a wrong report and she was not driving? She was in the parking lot. She was in the passenger seat. My nephew was driving. So we had just dropped off my uncle at the airport and went to the nearest McDonald's that I knew of, and this was it. So from up. She ordered coffee with her value meal, and I knew she liked cream and sugar in it. Uh, there was no place in, in my 1989 Ford Probe. Everything swelled. There were no cup holders in that car. Did you like cream and sugar option? It's in the back. It's in the back. Thank you. We pulled out of here knowing that we, I needed to get organized about what we eating and driving. And I knew she wanted to put her cream and sugar in the coffee, so pretty much pulled right there. Exactly in the spot and handed her coffee. We had already done that, and so we just went about organizing. And short period after that, she started screaming. Wanted to get the stop off to put cream and sugar in, so I put it between my knees and this time, trying to get the top off, and it just went. Mm. Hey, you can show me the burns. Yeah. What? Yeah. Did that change your mind at all? Well, uh, yes, if I saw interviews like that, I would definitely uh, take a different view of it from what I hear from the media. Oh my gosh. Excruciating pain. Uh, I was burned so severely that uh, they didn't think that was it. I'm a nurse and I was horrified at the type of injuries that she had sustained the skin grafts and the pieces that were still ongoing. So it was kind of a shocker because it's one thing to hear, but it's another thing to see. So it was kind of a, oh my goodness. We could see the extent of this injury. So we started saying, we need to ask McDonald's to pay for this. Under no circumstances would she ever sue or do anything like that. We thought that the company would take care of her soul and everything would be done. And Chuck and I wrote the letter to McDonald's. The very first thing we said is, your machine must be too hot, so look at it and fix it if it's broken. This must be an aberration. It must be an aberration. But if it is your, your policy, we ask you to worry about that policy because it's, uh, it, you do not want to have this happen to just one person. I mean, clearly it can't have happened to just one person. We were extremely surprised when McDonald's did not offer more than $800 on what was at that point a $10,000 medical problem. It's one of those things, it's really like if you ask people what the top 10 issues they care about, you know, the economy, healthcare, education, the civil justice system never even makes the top 20. It's just not in, in most people's radar screen until something bad happens to them. And then the first thing that most Americans think is that they should find a lawyer. When you are hurt by somebody, harmed in some way, and the person or the company that harms you is negligent or does this intentionally, you have a right to hold that wrongdoer accountable. And those are the civil courts that handle those kinds of cases, and that is our civil justice system. It's a fundamental right that we have. It stems from the Constitution, from the Bill of Rights. Hey there, kiddos, the lesson today is about our Constitution and the government. Our 
judicial branch of government is one of the very few places where an average person can actually go and confront a big corporation on somewhat of a level playing field. You know, the other two branches of government are dominated by money and politics. The judicial branch is not, because you can't wine and dine juries. In the courts, it's you versus General Motors, or it's you versus you know, Bank of America. And if you can present your information and your complaint in an effective way, you have just as much life of good as General Motors does. There's no other part of the government where that's true. I got involved in the Liebeck case by way of invitation from Reed Morgan, who was lead counsel. And once I met Reed and met Stella Liebeck and looked at the evidence, you know, they had my full attention because the coffee in question was brewed at temperatures that would approximate the temperature in your radiator after you drive from, you know, from your office to home. In discovery, we learned that in the franchise directives and manuals that the franchisee was required to follow, that they had to have their, their waters at certain temperatures. And then they said that the holding temperature should be 180 Fahrenheit to 190 Fahrenheit. Hot liquid, whether it's coffee or water or any liquid like that, if it's in the range of 180 degrees or hotter, if it is in contact with your skin for more than just a few seconds, it will produce very serious burns. If you're lucky, it will produce a second degree burn. If you're not as lucky, you will get third degree or full thickness burns requiring skin grafting and surgery. If you add up the uh, murder of Mr. McDonald's since January of uh, 1983 until March of uh, 92, uh, it's over 700 burn cases, and that doesn't surprise you, does it? I can't say that I'm surprised or not surprised. I'm, I'm glad the number's not higher. Uh, I'm, I'm really pleased that it's not more than that. I thought that was, <laughs> that was terrible that he was so indifferent about it, you know. Uh, even if it was just one person, that's enough to pay attention to. I mean, uh, a one person that spoke up, I'm sure there's more than that that was damaged with a hot coffee, but uh, it was it's so easy to burn at that temperature, and they were so indifferent about it. If you were to take a sip of that coffee enough to where you could feel it go down your throat, you can't do that at 180 to 190 degrees, can you, because you'll be burned. You better not do that, you won't get burned. We talked about different percentages of how much was her fault versus, you know, how much was McDonald's, and we finally came to assign 20% fault to Mrs. Liebeck because she had initially spilled the coffee, and we assigned 80% the uh, blame to McDonald's because they had a very long history of people being injured and they were so adamant that it was such a trivial thing that they weren't going to bother to do anything other than just continue to rake in the money on their coffee sales and the fact that it was their own records really damned McDonald's as far as I was concerned because it was very obvious that they knew there was a problem and they were ignoring it completely, just totally disregarding the consumer safety. <laughs> we looked at the coffee sales on a daily basis and we figured about two days worth of coffee sales. We thought that that was, you know, a fair amount and you know, given the damages we uh, assessed at 2.7 million. Punitive damages are very rare and they have a specific purpose which is to essentially change the behavior of the wrongdoer. The only way you can get the attention of a big company would be to uh, make punitive damages against them and this was a very small punitive damage we thought. the amount 
was reduced later. I think the initial award certainly got everybody's attention, not necessarily in a favorable way. <laughs> corporate America turned a disadvantage into an advantage, an extreme advantage as to how they dealt with this case and its aftermath. I mean, Mrs. Liebeck became a joke, the jury function became a joke, notwithstanding the fact that we had 12 good, hard-working New Mexico citizens on that jury, and it was a unanimous verdict, but they did a masterful job of taking this, this simple verdict and turning it upside down, so People like Mrs. Liebeck are trying to take economic advantage of, of the whole legal system. The tour reform groups, they love the McDonald's coffee case. This was a perfect case for them because it looked like it was frivolous. I had heard the word tort reform before my mother was injured, but I, I had never really understood what that meant. A tort is uh, a pastry. <laughs> section of the movie Hot Coffee. A couple takeaways. I think you got a whole different perspective in there. You heard how hot the water was. You heard a good analogy of it might equate to the level of the temperature of water in your radiator after you've driven it. You learned there were many reported cases. You heard the really unreasonable position McDonald's took forcing the plaintiff to go to trial. But one thing you can really take away is when you hear tort reform movement, this tells you where it started. 
It's no accident. It was an effort by big business, corporations, certain people of political persuasion to try to alter this constitutional right because the way tort reform manifests itself is in the primary function is in limiting the damages juries can award. Not to mentioning polluting the jury pool, thinking that when you go into a case involving an injury, that this is another one of those frivolous cases, like the frivolous McDonald's coffee case. I want to give you a couple more uh, quotes here. You're going to recognize this next person. Um, one of the points that this speaker made at the end was that the chief justification for pushing tort reform before Congress, then they were going to try to change this federally. I haven't really gotten into the fact that all of tort law is a matter of state law and state courts. This would have completely arrogated to federal these so-called states' rights people who want to propose state rights. We're going to take and lift a lot of state tort law and set caps on a national level. That was one of their moves. Now they've moved to the state level and they've had, unfortunately, a lot of success. And part of it comes from propaganda. Help me out here, I'm sorry. <laughs> you told me how to do this. No has ever been healed by a frivolous lawsuit. I urge the Congress to pass medical liability reform. Our economy is held back by irresponsible class actions and frivolous asbestos claims. And I urge Congress to pass legal reforms this year. Because lawsuits are driving many good doctors out of practice, leaving women in nearly 1,500 American counties without a single OBGYN, I ask the Congress to pass medical liability reform this year. You'll learn from them, if you watch the movie, you'll see that, um, you know, when Karl Rove was helping George Bush become governor of Texas, Rove was a tobacco company PR man at the time. And he developed a whole strategy to try to get certain folks elected by appealing to the business interests that if you elect us, we'll do certain things to limit the right of tr juries on an individual basis to hold wrongdoers accountable. And that manifested itself through a lot of public relations campaigns. I'll go through these, and you saw some of these in the award-winning documentary. It comes from all walks of life, by the way. Media, comics, uh, this is a, uh, Homer Simpson, I think, or I will not file a frivolous lawsuit. This is something I clipped out of. It's what, if you can't see, it shows a bunch of monkeys and it's disparaging class action lawsuits like follow the lawyers, the greedy lawyers, and uh, you know, you'll make money in a class action suit. You know, play the lawsuit lotto. You've all heard these terms. What it's resulted in is caps on damages in almost every state of some variety. Now, in order to understand how damages are capped. There's three types of damages juries can award. Juries are charged under our Constitution, our federal Constitution and our state Constitution in civil cases to do two things. Determine if there's someone that committed a wrong, whether it's a contract claim, a tort claim, property claim. That's called liability. That's a term we use as lawyers. And the second part is damages. What are the damages going to be? That's an integral part of a jury juror's duty in a civil case. Well, we have caps on damages on all damages in these four states, meaning the types of damages can be special damages in a personal injury case, past medical bills, lost earnings, those are generally called special damages. General damages are, called dam are damages for what's called pain that somebody suffered and suffering, which can be physical pain, mental anguish, disfigurement, loss of enjoyment of life. It's how an injury truly affects somebody. If any of you have had an injury, even if you have a broken ankle, you know it just isn't simple as putting it in a cast and doing a little therapy. 
You're not able to do all the things of daily life. Maybe it's not a permanent injury, but you're not able to do everything you were doing. And that comes under the heading of general damages. And the third area is punitive damages, which are to punish the wrongdoer, but there is a heightened level of proof. So those are the areas of damages. These states have a cap on all damages. Now the way caps work, the jury never gets to know about these caps. The jury goes in just like, and I don't know if there was a cap in the McDonald's coffee case, uh, whether the judge had to reduce it to $480,000, but in states where there are caps, the jurors don't get to know what those caps are. So the judges, the jurors make a determination of liability and damages. They don't know that. And then there's a post-trial motion that's filed to lower the damages to those caps. So jurors are never informed of that. They issue an, a verdict to co compensate the plaintiff for the wrongs that were done to him or her. They never know about it. We have total caps on all damages in these states. We have caps on damages called this non-economic damage, but it's damages for pain and suffering in many states, including this state in medical malpractice cases of 350,000. I'm sure Mr. Crockett and Mr. Gillock will tell you, talk to you about how that affects real people in er everyday life here in Nevada. We have states with caps on pain and suffering of $250,000 in many states not. I don't know why California is not on here, but California was the first to implement, I believe, a cap on damages in a medical malpractice case in 1974, implemented many changes to the civil justice system. But one of them was a cap on damages for pain and suffering of $250,000. You will still hear this number thrown about now almost 40 years later as the cap in some states when the, the value of that due to inflation is probably well over $1.3 million. So when you hear legislators talking about caps and they just arbitrarily want to set it, remember that original cap came back in 1974 when a dollar was worth a heck of a lot more than it is today. Here's states with caps on punitive damages. All these limit the right to trial by jury. What it does, caps are, a, are applied after the jury uh, issue an award and reduce it. This is a quote from a justice from the Alabama Supreme Court. Mr. Cook, it actually takes away the power of the jury to make a determination what is fair and reasonable amount. It takes away the power of the jury to individually evaluate each case. It's a big government, one size fits all approach to determining damages in a case. These legislators and these powerful interests that want to take this away from you are the same people that all of you vote for. We don't have limitations in this democracy on who you vote for. There's no cap. They distrust the people, even though these people are putting people in office to vote for these measures. Another attack, in addition to, remember the McDonald's coffee case, by itself, I think, is a major attack. We have public relations that sort of flowed from it. We have legislation to limit damages. We now have unlimited money in elections, and this is principally derived from, I just put Citizens United, but that's a Supreme Court case, Citizens United. And it was a case that allowed PACs unlimited uh, political action committees to put unlimited amounts of money into any type of campaign, including judicial elections. And one of the big beneficiaries of this is the U.S. Chamber of Commerce. The U.S. Chamber of Commerce is a national organization that represents multinational corporations. The U.S. Chamber is not your local Chamber of Commerce. They don't represent the florist. They don't represent the car washman. They don't represent the auto mechanic. They don't represent the local insurance sales. That's not what the U.S. Chamber of Commerce is about. It's not a government agency. It's a private organization of multinational corporations. And they spend an enormous amount of money in elections to get their people elected. And they also spend an, an enormous amount of money in judicial elections, as you'll see. This is uh, some of the uh, members of the board of directors. 
of the Chamber of Commerce, some big corporations, and, and because it's a private corporation, we don't get the transparency we should, we as the people, but suffice it to say, these are some of the members of the board of directors, and Mr. Donahue is the CEO of this. And just so it's no accident that members of the Supreme Courts across the nation are being, uh, having contributions from big corporations, Chamber of Commerce, Americans for Prosperity, American Crossroads, a lot of other major political, political action committees. Here's a quote that we got for you at the Institute of Legal Reform, which is a branch of the U.S. Chamber of Commerce. We're doing much, much better in courts and in the election of, of, of judges to the state Supreme Court. And we're in those races. We'll spend $19 million <clears throat> in the election of those judges and state attorneys general in this next election. The last area is just sort of a summary of another area that's infringing upon this most important constitutional right, and that is arbitration agreements. Judge Williams mentioned a little bit about uh, arbitration as, an, as a method of alternative dispute resolution, and it is. It has the effect, though, of depriving someone of a right to go to court to hold someone accountable, and the arbitration system unfortunately, is set up by the business you're dealing with. They are prominent in investment contracts. If any of you have ever made any investments with Morgan Stanley or any others, you will see you are signing away your right to trial by jury if there's a dispute. And you have to go to arbitration if you want, if, if somebody takes your money, if a broker was to steal your money, you may have to go to arbitration. And guess how that arbitration process is set up? It's set up by the financial institutions, and it's who picks the panel of arbitrators. Credit card contracts frequently do, nursing home contracts and employment, employment relationships and some insurance agreements. These are all encroachments on this right to trial by jury. One, some last thoughts I want to leave with you before we open up for questions and let Mr. Crockett come up, is it's very important to understand that when a a plaintiff wins a case, and this is not my language, this is a quote from uh, a, a Mississippi, I think, Supreme Court, former Supreme Court justice that I didn't give credit to here in this, but I can tell you that's where I got it from. It says, when a plaintiff wins a case, he or she wins it for all others who have or would have suffered the injustice, just not themselves. It's the one entity that can hold the business and bad doctors or bad actors of any variety, I'm not here to pick on doctors at all, accountable in the civil justice system. We have that right and it allows the average person to confront big corporations. There's no other part of the government where that's... With that, uh, turn it off. Mr. Crockett, do you want to come up? Sure. <clears throat> I wanted to talk with you about the practical consequences of tort reform and caps on damages. Caps on damages, I'm sure you're all familiar with because you've heard something about them. What they are is they are the opposite of a jury trial. Because in a jury trial where there are no caps, the jury is allowed to decide what they think is the right amount of compensation. After hearing all the evidence, after hearing the attorneys for both sides argue their points, and the corporations and business interests in the United States hire the best there is, okay? It's not as if they're the underdogs going into court although the public relations campaign that they wage war on would make you think, why, these poor corporations, how do they ever get by, all right? 
one of the more telling examples was the McDonald exec who said 700 burn cases. <sighs> Might have thought it would have been more. Glad it wasn't. 700 is acceptable. 700 burn cases. And so caps on damages are the complete opposite of a jury trial. Because as Cliff pointed out, the jury is not told what the caps are. I had a case involving a young boy, 14 years old. And he came in contact with a regular street light pole. It had been raining. He had just paid $65 for a brand new pair of Nike sneakers took them off, it was August, decided he'd rather walk home barefoot than to get his new Nikes wet. Typical 14-year-old kid. So he puts his Nikes back in the plastic bag, and as he's walking down Sahara, he walks into a puddle, rainwater, around this streetlight pole, and immediately collapses to the ground. Fortunately, a Nevada power lineman saw this happen and when somebody went to reach to get the kid, he said, no, 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 don't, don't touch him. And he got his hot sticks out, pulled the kid out of the water. Well, it turns out, and the boy was killed. He was electrocuted. So it turns out what had happened was, a few months earlier, a drunk driver had hit that light pole and broken it, flattened it out. So the city of Las Vegas dispatched its crew to come out and replace it. When they did that, they didn't connect the third wire, which is a ground wire. And the ground wire is connected to an electrical relay device that when it feels this interruption of current, it shuts down the power. It's a safety device. And what had happened was the water from the rain had built up inside the base of the pole, and there were bare wires that had not been properly wrapped by the city guys. And because they didn't attach the ground wire, the water was electrified when the boy stepped into it. So city of Las Vegas, I wrote to them, I said, look, um, I represent the parents, but instead of getting me involved, in those days there was a $50,000 cap. It's called a sovereign immunity cap. There's a cap on any tort that the state, the county, or the city commits. Doesn't matter whether they kill somebody or cause them to be a paraplegic. It's a cap, and it's one the jury is never told about. I said, why don't you keep me out of this case just send the parents a check each for $50,000 for the death of their 14-year-old kid. The city said, well, no, that's the most we have to pay. If you want that, come and get it. <laughs> so we had to file suit, hire an expert electrician, go through three years of litigation. We get to trial. And their expert for the city, whom the city attorney hadn't really prepped, but I knew him to be an honest man, so I didn't even take his deposition. I'd used him as an expert before. I said, Mr. Brown, have you assessed all these things? And he said, yes, I have. And I said, what's your opinion? He said, it's the most egregious case of negligence by electricians I've ever seen. And I said, and you're saying that as the retained expert for the city of Las Vegas, is that correct? He says, yes, it's true. Judge Mosley called us to the bench, looked at the city attorney, he says, are you kidding me? Well, it was Mosley, he said, are you kidding me? <laughs> Three years of litigation. And their, their attitude was they were just so incredibly arrogant, it's like the most you're gonna get is 100, okay? 50 for each parent. So we're gonna make you spend money on expert witness fees, court costs and expenses and all that, all of which is gonna eat out of that hundred that the, the family will not get. You, you can't help that. The lawyer has to advance the court costs and expenses, but he must by law recoup them from the client when the case is settled. 
So all the city was accomplishing was to reduce the amount that the family would ultimately receive. Why? I mean, it was a retaliatory kind of thing to do. Plus, the jury never knew until the case was over. They made a very handsome award of damages, thinking that they were really doing some justice here. When they found out that the city was only responsible for 50000 to each parent, they were just livid. And as taxpayers, they wanted to know why all this time had been wasted fighting over such a case when there was no fight to be had. That's an example of caps on damages. And it exists in any case in this state where it's a tort, whether it's a car accident or electrocution or whatever the circumstances may have been, if the city, the county, or the state was at fault. It does not apply to civil rights cases. So when you see that somebody was being, because that's a federal kind of thing. So if you see a case where somebody was uh, manhandling a, a person during an arrest and they injure him or kill him and he's awarded $900,000, you say, I thought Jim said you couldn't get more than, well, those are not tort cases. Those are civil rights cases in the federal law. Now, we just recently, uh, the trial lawyers were successful in getting that. We've been trying to get that cap lifted for years. Finally got it bumped from, it was originally 25, then 35. Then we got it bumped to 50. And last legislative session was bumped to 75, and it's now $100,000. Now, it doesn't matter how serious the injury is. If you incur $200,000 in medical bills because of what the city uh, driver did when he crashes through a red light and wipes you and your family out, doesn't change the fact, even if it's 200,000 medical bills, it's still capped at $100,000. But these are the kinds of things that you never find out about as a citizen until you're a victim. It's always a secret. And then when you're sitting in the lawyer's office and they say, well, it's capped, and you go, well, I never heard of that. No, you heard just the opposite. You heard about the great injustice that lawyers are perpetrating upon the public. You heard about litigious society and frivolous lawsuits. So much so that you found yourself thinking, you know, I, I, we probably need caps on damages. That's the kind of a campaign that they've been working, is to the point where they've brainwashed you into thinking that, yeah, that, I want that too. But you know you don't, okay? Because a cap on damages predetermines what's going to happen in the case. It says in medical malpractice, $350,000 is the most that can be recovered for pain and suffering. So what about medical bills? Well, let's say your medical bills were 600,000. Usually they're paid for by an insurance company or TRICARE or the Teachers Health and Welfare Trust or culinary, whatever. They get their money back out of the settlement, by law and by contract. So that money doesn't go to the injured party. Then you have loss of income. Well, your loss of income is what you would have made had you not been injured. So that's just putting you back to even, square one. So those non-economic damages for pain and suffering, that's the only place where a person gets compensated for total paralysis or brain injury or the disability caused from loss of a limb. All right, that's the only place where they get compensated. It had such a profound impact that in 2002, when they passed tort reform and medical malpractice, I quit taking medical malpractice cases because the only kinds of medical malpractice cases I'd been handling most of my life were the wrongful death of children who have no economic value in that system, okay? or senior citizens who have no economic value in that system, or stay-at-home parents who have no economic value. So I was always handling cases where there was no loss of income. It was all about the loss of life or loss of a person. So for 10 years now, I've just quit taking medical malpractice cases because the law changed. So there's an example of how a cap does much more than control the damages in an individual case. 
it stops the lawyer from even taking the case. All right, so here's why I think we need to raise the awareness of all of our fellow, fellow citizens. Caps on damages are about trust. Corporate America doesn't trust you. Well, but you know, we kind of do. Because every day we go into a large store and we buy stuff from them, give them our money. We don't know where this stuff's coming from. We don't know who made it. We don't know if it's clear, uncontaminated. We don't know if it's safe. Don't know anybody, if anybody got inside that pharmaceutical bottle. We don't know if the doctor has cleaned his endoscopic instruments. We, we just assume that um, we wouldn't do something like that. So we assume that they wouldn't either. Even though, again and again, we find that our trust is misplaced. We don't have a choice. Corporate America is the King George of the 19th, 20th, 21st century. We have to deal with them. There are some people I admire who live off the grid, you know, they grow their own vegetables, raise their own food, God bless them. I wouldn't have a clue how to do that. I'd starve to death. Obviously, I'm not starving to death. <laughs> but uh, that, so as a result, I buy my $4 a gallon gas from, you know, Shell. And I'm assuming that $4 is what you gotta pay. I buy my groceries from the grocery store. I buy my pharmaceuticals from the pharmacy. And I trust that they're gonna give me what I deserve. And most of the time they do. But these people are willing to accept 700 severe burns. Eh, gonna make an omelet, gonna break a few eggs. They consider it acceptable. The only way they get to find out that it's not acceptable the only sensory input they can feel is when a jury says, no, 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 no. You can't do that. Now, Cliff mentioned the Ford Pinto case, which happened so long ago. There are some of you in this room where you think, yeah, I think I heard something about that. The jury returned a verdict in that. The Ford Pinto was a small economy car that when it was struck from behind in a conventional rear end accident, at fairly low speeds, it would explode on impact. When any other car made would just, you know, it would get crunched. But the Pinto would explode on impact. There was a memo that was uncovered, which was called the Let Them Burn Memo. Ford had an accounting analysis done. They said, you know, we got 1.6 million of these cars out there on the road, and uh, they're having these accidents, and..." Obviously, not 1.6 million are going to get rear-ended, but some people are, and we're having people getting horrifically burned and killed and stuff. And they knew before they put the cards to market that it was going to do it. But they had their accountants do an analysis. They said, okay, we know some of these people, it would never occur to them to sue us. They're just going to think the guy who rear-ended them is at fault. So what do we do about the rest of these people? We're going to have a certain number of burns and deaths. And their accounting department said, well, the part costs $9. It's a different filler pipe. $40 labor to install it. X number of vehicles, plus the recall letters, plus this and that. We figure if you just kind of pay out settlements on these claims and play hardball with the people as they come up, one at a time, over the lifespan of the product, you can save a hundred and twenty-nine billion, a million dollars by not fixing it, by letting them burn. And so Ford said, sounds like a good decision. And that's what they decided to do. They said, okay, we'll save 129 million by dealing with the occasional burn and, and death claim as it comes up. It's a great decision, except that when there was a, they call it needle in the haystack discovery, that's when you ask a big company to give you something, they say, okay, we'll give it to you. They show up with big trucks full of documents, figuring you'll never find it. Somebody found the let them burn memo. So, do you trust yourself to make an intelligent, informed decision 
Uh, if you're sitting on a jury, of course you do. Don't let corporate America scare you into thinking you can't trust the person sitting next to you, because you can. Thank you. All right, we have time for, I think, two questions, unfortunately, but uh, the presentation was very informative. Uh, first question regarding tort reform. The person understood this to mean those who brought forth so-called frivolous lawsuits would pay court costs. Can you comment on this? It's true. Uh, if, he, if you are bringing a spurious or vexatious lawsuit, uh, you can be held accountable for attorney's fees, court costs, and expenses of the other party if it's determined that your lawsuit was spurious and vexatious. And the other thing they can do is a settlement offer can be made in writing called an offer of judgment. And if you don't get a result that's better than the written offer of judgment, you are responsible for the attorney's fees, court costs, and expenses that they incurred after they made the offer. It's kind of a loser pays rule. So when you hear Newt Gingrich and other people say, what we need in this country is a loser's, loser pays rule. We have it, you know, it exists. If um, you unfortunately have caused an accident, can the injured party sue you for your personal assets if you don't have adequate insurance coverage to properly compensate them for their injuries? You can, but in 37 years of doing this, I, and I think Jerry will agree and Cliff will agree, there's no point. If the person didn't have enough money to buy adequate insurance, it's not like they're sitting on some hidden assets. They just don't have it. They're a turnip, and you're not going to get blood out of them. So I, I can think of one or two instances in that whole period of time where somebody personally had to go in their pocket, but it's, uh, it was extremely small and extremely rare. And finally, have any of the caps passed in the states been reversed? Um, some caps were deemed unconstitutional. I don't know of any case where there's been legislation passed implementing caps where the legislature went back and <coughs> voided it. But uh, there have been cases where it was found to be unconstitutional under that very powerful language of our federal constitution and of state constitution. As a matter of fact, this was part of the campaign that Chamber of Commerce, uh, Karl Rove, and other political action committees have been pushing for the last 10, 20 years to elect people on state Supreme Courts who are business friendly, who are going to find these cap statutes constitutional. And uh, again, the movie, uh, the documentary, the award-winning documentary by Susan Saladoff we made available to you at the end of this Mr. Gillock's presentation and you get a, a, fur, a more full uh, exposition of that position where it's documented uh, in that film. Okay, please join me in thanking Mr. Pocket and Mr. Marichek for the presentation. We'll take a five minute break at this point. Please be back at uh, 35 after. Well, four minutes, but. <laughs> Hello, I'm Larry Springberg, your host for the People's Law School. I'm also a lawyer specializing in accident and medical malpractice cases. The presentation you're watching is one of a multi-session series on the legal topics which affect the daily lives of Nevadans like you. As a member of our home viewing audience, you too can earn a diploma from the People's Law School and receive the course handbook free of charge. To receive a diploma and handbook, simply send us your name, address, and telephone number stating which sessions you have watched and the information will be mailed to you. Mail your request to the People's Law School. 406 North Nevada Street, Carson City, Nevada, 89703, or call 775-885-7174. The supply of printed course material is limited, so don't delay. We welcome your feedback. The People's Law School is for you, the citizens of Nevada. So let us hear from you. 
Uh, we're now for our, here now for our final uh, portion of the program tonight. Uh, this is specifically regarding medical malpractice. Uh, one of our speakers, Steve Baker, uh, had a personal matter come up and so uh, Mr. Gillock will be our sole speaker this evening. Uh, Jerry Gillock has been practicing law in the Las Vegas for nearly four decades. He has received Martindale Hubble's highest AV preeminent rating for his legal knowledge, analytical capabilities, judgment, advocacy skills, and legal experience. He was the Nevada Justice Association's Lawyer of the Year in 2003 and has been repeatedly selected for inclusion to Best Lawyers in America. Mr. Gillock frequently lectures to professional organizations as su on such topics as medical malpractice, products liability, and premises liability in Nevada. Please welcome Mr. Gillick for his presentation on medical malpractice. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen of the jury. <laughs> You've just heard the evidence in a medical malpractice case and now you're going to bec become the finders of the facts. When I was trying to think of what to say to you on the way down here today, I said to myself, what is a jury? I know we've all seen the movie To Kill a Mockingbird. And in that movie, Gregory Peck plays a country lawyer. And he's getting ready to go down to the courthouse and make a closing argument. And his daughter, Scout, is on the porch. And she says, Atticus, what is a jury? And he says, a jury is the great leveler. A jury is the great leveler. In other words, it's one of the few places in our entire society where someone with no assets, someone with no education, someone with little or no uh, job to go home from at night and talk to his family about can stand on the same footing as anyone else. It's also a very unique system, this jury. A jury system is the only system we have where every participant in the jury system itself takes an oath. The judge takes an oath, the attorneys take an oath, the witnesses take an oath, the jurors take an oath, the court reporter, the court clerks, everybody takes an oath. So it's not barbershop talk. It's not something that you talk about on the, on the street corner. But it's where you search for the truth. And in a medical malpractice case, the search is a little bit different than it is in a lot of other cases. Because in medical, medical cases, we have to meet certain threshold requirements before we can even file them. Before a case can even go to the courthouse, to be placed on the court clerk's desk, to be filed with the clerk, we have to meet a threshold where some medical provider who works in the same or similar field has said <coughs> that the person that we want to file the case against, be it a nurse, a hospital, or a doctor, or some, and I'll go over the list of providers that are included, has fallen below the standard of care required of them. Sound pretty easy? Get a doctor to say that? I don't think so. <laughs> if you're a plaintiff, to meet that burden sometimes can be very ominous on the most obvious of cases. I used to defend doctors for years, as Mr. Crockett will tell you. I was, till 1985, before I switched over to do the Lord's work, I was defending the cases, and I was defending doctors, hospitals, manufacturers, Pirelli tires, it didn't matter. I defended them. And then in 1985, I started working on the other side of the coin, and I found out one thing. I found out how difficult it is. But in a medical malpractice case, when I was working on the other side of the, of the coin, and the other side of the cases, I would tell people, you know, 
this is the, you can save yourselves a lot of aggravation by simply zipping your lips. If you're unwilling to talk and you're unwilling to testify, then the other side cannot bring their case to court. And I would tell them, you have a responsibility to get rid of bad doctors, but you don't have a responsibility to get out in the hallway and make comments that will lead someone to think that they have a malpractice case. That's what I would tell them on the other side. And a lot of times now, on this side of the case, where I've been for the last 20 years, I find that the doctors are most often, still to this day, are most often the ones that are primarily responsible for mal medical malpractice cases going through the legal system. Because why? Well, because they don't like bad medicine either. Doctors are very proud of their accomplishments. They're very proud of the advancements in medicine. And doctors do not like bad medicine. As Jim would have told you if he was up here lecturing on medical malpractice, 10% of the doctors are responsible for 90% of the malpractice. We had a doctor in this town back in the year 2000. In fact, Jim's partner was one of the, one of the uh, attorneys who was re most responsible for putting together the testimony that ultimately led to this doctor leaving our community. And what it was, it was a, I'll just tell you a few war stories along the way. And then also, even though you're writing your questions on cards, if you wave the card to someone, I think the reason for that is they want to get the cards on the record. But if you stand up to ask a question or if you shout it out, I'll repeat it so it does get on the record because I'm just going to be telling you this as we go. And I like to answer questions when they come up. Now, what happened in that case is we had a neurosurgeon. And he had a loose formation partnership with another neurosurgeon. And I won't tell you his name, but it's D'Ambrosia. <laughs> and this neurosurgeon would, had a contest going with the other neurosurgeon. And they call it the Green Jacket Contest after the Masters Golf Tournament. Who did the most surgeries? They symbolically got a green jacket at the end of the year. And when you looked at the amount of income generated by those two doctors compared to the other ones in that office, it was up in the $3 million range for one year for surgeries that they were doing one right after the other. If they needed a second opinion, this doctor would give it and say, yeah, you need the surgery. And that doctor would give it and say, yeah, you need the surgery. And they were doing this back and forth. 89 claims, 89 people were injured and had reported malpractice cases against this particular doctor. I happen to have one of those cases. And one of the cases, the, the guy it was a retired banker from Los Angeles. And he was out here to retire with his wife. Bought a place near the country club so he could go over and play golf. The doctor failed to see him after the surgery, refused to see him, refused to follow up, and his spine melted and paralyzed him from the neck down. The guy couldn't move. I mean, literally could not move. He was on a bed, one of the, what they call a sand bed, so that you don't get bed sores. And he would beg his wife to take the gun off of the wall and shoot him. Of course, she wouldn't do it. But these two doctors were then, one of them was brought before the state medical board, Dr. D'Ambrosia. There were 45 complaints or so at the medical board. The medical board took a very strong affirmative approach. And they said, if you'll leave Nevada, we won't take your license. So he left Nevada. He was in California at Cottage Hospital in Long Beach for approximately three months before he killed a 35-year-old man. And by the way, he's still practicing over there. Now. <laughs> <laughs> but I tell you that just to tell you that the doctors here detested that man because he did more to destroy the image of the medical profession in that short window of time than, than you can possibly imagine. So the doctors are proud people and they don't want bad medicine. So if a person asks them direct questions, a lot of times they'll get direct answers and therefore the case will eventually make its way to the legal system. Now, we have a very strict draconian law in 
Nevada. You've heard about the 350 cap. You've heard that 350 cap is, is, is all you get in a medical malpractice case. That's one of the issues we have to deal with on a regular basis. The other one, and I, by the way, my materials, I gave you the statute because it it's, tells you all the definitions. And the, my outline, as you can see, is less than a page long because there's only four or five major issues here that we deal with on a regular basis that I felt I could cover in, in the limited time we have. But let's talk about, let's, let's start by talking about the statute of limitations. A statute of limitations is the time within which you have to file a lawsuit. So you only have X number of months or X number of years to file most lawsuits. If you're injured by a beacon's truck going down the highway, you have two years to file your lawsuit. In a medical malpractice case, you have one year from the time you knew or should have known of the medical negligence of the malpractice. And boy, do we fight over that. The, other, the, the defense attorneys a lot of times will say, well, they should have known something went wrong. He's only 39 years old and he died. So therefore, that's when the statute should start to run. We take the position that until a doctor tells them that something was wrong, that's when the statute should run. Well, it's a big gray area. It's not as cut and dry as that. If they go, if they go to a lawyer after the death and they picked up the medical records after the death, then I've seen cases where the judge has said, well, obviously she knew something was wrong. She got the medical records and she went to a lawyer. That lawyer she went to, not being a specialist in medical malpractice or knowing where to go to California or New Jersey or somewhere else to get a hold of a doctor who might be willing to give them an opinion, tells her she's got no case. So this lawyer A says, you don't have a case. So she puts it back in the cabinet and she goes home. And as soon as she gets over the grieving, which is a natural process that takes months and sometimes years and sometimes goes on forever. But as she approaches the, uh, the period of time when she's getting more rational and starting to think more about the events, she'll go to a different attorney who specializes in medical malpractice or does medical cases. And as you've heard tonight, there's very few people that do that. Um, and that attorney, instead of saying, yes, you have a case, or no, you don't have a case, says, you know, the first thing we have to do is we have to have a doctor look at it, or a nurse, or whoever we're talking about that did the wrong thing. And that person has to tell the lawyer and the, and the client that the doctor who did the treatment fell below the appropriate standard of care. Okay, that's, that's what we call medical malpractice. Someone who falls below the standard of care. So what does that mean? That means that there's this standard of care out there. So let's just go to the dictionary and look it up and see what it says for appendicitis. Let's go see what it says for ruptured appendix. Guess what? There is no written standard of care. It depends on what you can get another doctor to say by looking at the case and say, you know what? He came in, we pushed on his abdomen, we let it go, and he had what they call rebound pain, which is what you get with appendicitis. And we sent him home and said, here's some uh, antacids, you've got a stomach issue. And sent him home, and his appendix ruptures, he gets septic, and all kinds of problems. The standard of care is what an ordinarily prudent doctor would do in the same or similar circumstances. If the ordinarily prudent doctor, ordinarily means A, B, C, D, E, F, not the F doctor, not the D doctor, not the A doctor, not the B doctor, but the C doctor. So what the C doctor would do is what is considered to be the standard of care. I've seen doctors get on the stand and say, well, I practice above the standard of care and I wouldn't have sent him home, but the standard of care would have been to send him home. But I wouldn't do that because I practice as the A doctor. So we have 
we have this vague, ambiguous standard out there. We have to have a sworn affidavit from that health care provider that the proposed defendant fell below the standard of care attached to the complaint that we file at the court. <laughs> and it has to be from the same or similar field. You can't get a pediatrician to give you an affidavit against an OBGYN and vice versa. You, you have to have them from the same field and that they're familiar with the same, and they have to be doing it at the same time. In other words, a retired doctor can't give you an affidavit about a surgical procedure because he's no longer doing it. So he has to be practicing in the same field and, and familiar with the standards at the time the malpractice occurs. The, so you file your complaint, you get to that point where you file your complaint and you've got the affidavit. So let's see, I guess fairness would dictate that when the doctor is served with a complaint and he has to file an answer, we would expect to see his affidavit from his doctor saying that they didn't do anything wrong. There's no such requirement under the law. The doctor or the defendant, the nurse, the hospital, does not have to file any type of affidavit <coughs> at that stage or at any stage until it's time to declare who your expert witnesses are going to be and who you're going to rely on to prove your case. And by now, you're into this lawsuit 300 and some odd days. Those are two of the major hurdles, statute of limitations. Because let's go back to that. And I wander some, but it's probably age more than anything. Uh, the statute of limitations <clears throat> says, well, you got a whole year. But you know what? You also have to get a doctor, remember, to review these records. And they don't just j jump to attention when you send them a case. So you have to find them. Once you find them, you've got to get them to review the records. And then once they review the records, you've got to get them to contact you and give you an affidavit. So if someone dies April 15th in the year 2011 and it's January of 2012 before they finally get to the point where they're going to be able to talk to you, you're going to be awfully lucky to make it to the, to the one year time of death and if you don't make that one your time of death, then the other side's going to say, well, they knew or should have known, and then you're going to fight all these legal motions and everything that go on. The important thing is that the effect of the cap, and I think both of the earlier speakers kind of hit on it, when they said, well, all you can get is 350. A jury is not told that either. If you go into a trial on a medical malpractice case, and you've got the death of a, a, of a breadwinner or the death of a, well, let's say, let me give you a case I'm working on right now. I've got a nine-month-old boy whose, whose brain was swelling inside his skull. All he needed was a shunt. Instead of getting the shunt, the pediatrician said, well, check, well, check, boy doing fine, nothing abnormal, normal cephalic until the brain came through the skull. Okay, now the boy is, is, is brain damaged, and guess what? If we win, $350,000, $350, after the court costs come out and after the attorney's fees come off. And the cap is self-consuming. Today it's $350,000. Today the cap is $350,000. You come into my office. I haven't hired a doctor. It's $350,000. I have to hire a doctor to look at it. That's $12,000. So $12,000, they'll look at it and give you a report. And then after you get the report, it's 340, what, 338,000 is what the cap really is because that cost come out. So the closer you get to trial, the more you've spent, the less the cap, the cap keeps floating downwards, or I should say racing downwards. So what I did is I, I, I took a case where I wanted to see what an unemployed woman who died as a result of medical malpractice, and I mean 
the malpractice was absolutely gross. They not only gave her the wrong medication, they gave her 10 times the dosage of the wrong medication that she should have gotten. And she died as a result of getting, I think, 18 milligrams of Dilaudid, which is 10 times as strong as morphine, in a three-hour period. Not much issue about the negligence in that case. But guess what? The other side had experts that said there was no negligence. So they fought and fought and fought and fought. But I had a widower. I had four kids. They're going to share in the 350 after court costs, after attorney's fees. But the family was pretty courageous and they wanted to fight. They wanted to, they wanted to take a stand. So I said, this was back in 2004 when the cap had just been changed and rechanged. And so at the, end of the run, at the end of the run, three weeks before the trial, they offered us 300,000. If we had gone the extra three weeks, by that time, we had like six doctors on board. We had had to pay them, hopefully, 12,000. It could have been substantially more to get them here to testify. And we had six of them. So that 300,000 would have gone down even much further. So we took the 300,000 and we divided it up accordance with the statute. And I think the four kids each got $7,800. And the husband got 12,000. And that was after all those years of litigation. So I spent a majority of my time convincing people that they really, unless there's, unless there's something going on here, they really should think about not filing a lawsuit because they're going to have to relive the tragedy every day. Every time there's a deposition, they've got to re-go through it. Someone files an affidavit, I've got to get them in and say, you know, they're saying that you knew that there was negligence when you went to that first lawyer. And they say, no, he told me there wasn't. He told me there wasn't. And it wasn't until eight months later. OK, now I've got to go through it step by step. Well, what were you thinking when you went in and, and you saw that uh, your husband was dying? And, and then the doctor comes out and said, he should have been shunted 12 hours ago. Well, see, that we had an aneurysm in this particular case. It ruptured. And if it had been shunted, it wouldn't have ruptured, and the person would have lived. So, you have, you have to go through that tragedy every single, every single step of the way. And it's not pleasant. So I spend a lot of time telling people, you really don't want to do it. Now, every once in a while, uh, you'll get a case that's so egregious, it'll get your dander up. And so you'll, you'll just go in there and plow away at it. Now, I know my time is up, but I did want to call your attention to one other thing. In a malpractice ca case, you not only you have a little bit of different standard. You ha is it all right if I talk another minute or two? Um, you have another thing that you have to prove. You have to prove that the negligence was the cause of the death, the legal cause. OK? So not just that you know, they died from the overdose, but that died from the negligent giving of the overdose is what caused the death. And what you have to prove, because you have nurses, you may have one patient that saw four doctors. You may have one patient that saw four doctors and six nurses and a, and a hospitalist. And what you have to establish is that the conduct of each one of those was a substantial factor in the causing of the death. Substantial factor versus a proximate cause. In an auto accident, you might have been able to say, this person ran the red light, and running the red light was, a, was the proximate cause. In medical, you have to establish that it was a substantial factor in causing the death. Now, guess what else? You can't just sue the bad guy. If, if someone is 1% negligent or 10% negligent, the infinite wisdom of the legislature was such that there's no longer any joint and several liability. So if this doctor is 50% res responsible, that's all you can get from him. If this doctor is 25%, you have to bring him into the lawsuit. If this nurse is 5% over here, you've got to bring her into the lawsuit to get that 5%, which doesn't mean too much to, uh, how, as fast as I covered it, it doesn't mean too much. 
So you got 5,000 for the nurse, you got 12,000 for the other doctor, you got 12,000 for the other doctor, just in expert witness fees. Before you file the case, and we have no bargaining power. We can't say to the insurance company, you're exposing this doctor's personal assets. He's got his kid's college education in trust, and you're exposing him, and, we're gonna, and his trust could go away. Why? Because the insurance companies are so reasonable that they are charging the doctors for million dollar premium, they're charging them a premium for a million dollars worth of insurance, knowing that all they can pay out ever is 350. So, so the doctors are happy to pay it, and then, but you can't scare a doctor, you can't scare a hospital, because if you go all the way to trial, they're gonna appeal it. I had a verdict on the wrongful death of a 15-year-old kid who they gave the wrong treatment for, for leukemia, and he died, I had a verdict of $423, and they appealed it. Even though I would take the 350. Why? Because our Supreme Court has a settlement procedure in the appellate process. So when you win, you don't win. Every single medical malpractice case that I've handled, and I've only handled probably 5,000 of them, but I've only tried, I've only gone to trial on maybe 25 of them in the last three or four years. Every single one of them has gotten appealed to get to that settlement conference because they know that a judge from the Supreme Court appointed settlement judge is going to twist our arms to take less than the 350 in order to clear the calendar of the Supreme Court. So anyway, it's a pretty complicated field and it's, it has a lot of landmines as you go along and it's, it's a type of field that, as you, you've heard my name and you read it in the People's Law School, you probably wouldn't have heard it or seen it anywhere else in the city because I don't advertise, I don't, my cases all come from other lawyers who won't do them anymore. <laughs> and, and we take a look at them and we see if we can be of some help and sometimes we can. All right, everyone, please join me in thanking Mr. Gallock for an excellent presentation. Thank Very, you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. And before you go, let me remind you to please turn in your evaluations of this evening's speakers. Thank you all. Since I ran over, if anybody has any questions, yeah. I'd be happy to, to stick around here and answer them for you. Uh, Gillock, Jerry Gillock. G-I-L-L-O-C-K. Yes, okay.